Hello and welcome to the LCTV News. In this edition of the LCTV News, City of Lynn receives grant, City Hall 70th anniversary, Arts After Hours Meatball, Sit Down with Goldfish Pond Association, and more. On Wednesday, U.S. Rep. Seth Malton announced the City of Lynn was rewarded $1.2 million in federal grants to repair the Seaport Landing Marina. The reimbursement comes from the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Federal Disaster Aid Program. The Seaport Landing Marina was severely damaged during the blizzard of 2013. The funding will be used to repair the main sidewalk, the aid dock which has been said to be unusable by James Marsh, the city's community development director. In 2017, FEMA reimbursed $1.3 million to the city. Part of that funding went towards repairing the marina's gas and diesel fuel dock. Beginning on September 1st, the Lynn Cultural Council are accepting applicants to receive grants. Individuals, schools, and cultural organizations are eligible to apply for a grant. The grant will go towards funding for school field trips, after-school programs, concerts, festivals, lectures, theaters, dance, music, and film. For the 2019-2020 year, grants will be paid in advance. After approval of the grant, the grantee must submit a grant acceptance form. After completion of the program, a final report must be submitted within two weeks by the grantee. Those interested in applying for the grant should contact the Lynn Cultural Council. This upcoming school year, there will be new school day hours for Brickett Elementary and Tracy Elementary School. Those hours are going to be from 8.15 until 2.15. To learn more, just go to visit the City of Lynn Public Schools website. Lynn City Hall will be celebrating its 70th anniversary on September 10th. The, festiv the festivities will go on from 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. Mayor, Mayor McGee will give a welcome address to guests and there will be an unveiling of the City Hall, a, a four-floor art exhibit celebrating the roots of the community. There also will be a guided and self-guided tour of City Hall. On Tuesday, a single family fire has displaced five residents. The fire occurred on Northern Ave when began on the porch and made its way all the way up to the attic. The property has been deemed unlivable by Lynn Fire Captain Joseph Zoukas. The cause of the fire was due to careless disposal of cigarettes. No one was injured during the fire and the five residents are staying with family at this time. Now for the police update. Two arrests have been made in connection with the fatal shooting at Warren Street Playground on Saturday that left one man dead and three injured. Roger, Roger Lowe Morrison was arrested and charged with murder and armed assault to murder. Louis Falcon was charged with accessory after the fact of murder. On Monday, they pleaded not guilty at Lynn District Court. They are being held without bail. Police are still in search for a third, sus a third suspect who they believe to be the second shooter. Anyone who has any tips about the second shooter are encouraged to call the Essex State Police Detective Unit at 978-745-8908 or Lynn Police Detectives at 781-477-4444. Tips can be sent via text at 847-411. On Tuesday, two people were arrested by Lynn police after they were found with heroin, fentanyl, and a variety of prescription pills. Marcelo Cruz was charged with trafficking over 10 grams of fentanyl, and Cynthia Rubin was charged with Class B and Class C drug possession. Rubin was also charged, with, was also charged for possession of drugs that police found in the trunk of her car, which included Seroquel, Amphetamine, and Xanax. Lynn police also seized $102 in cash from the vehicle. An investigation remains in the robbery of a 21-year-old man at Knife Point. The robbery occurred on the 21st of August on Boston Street, where the man in a, in a, police, in a police report said he was robbed of his wallet and cell phone. No arrests have been made yet, and Lynn police are still in the incident remains under investigation. Arts After Hours held its annual meatball at the All Care VNA rooftop, and LCTV sent a crew to the festivities. We are
are here at Meatball at the All Care VNA deck. People are starting to come in. We've got the dirty floorboards warming up, getting ready to start playing. Amazing food catered by Christopher's Cafe is being passed around. We've got drinks flowing. We've got music about to get going and a gorgeous view with a gorgeous sunset starting. Basically, this is one of, us, one of our biggest fundraisers to help um, be able to produce uh, everything that we do throughout the year. Uh, this is we're in season nine for Arts After Hours. We have um, two shows left this year. We have Carrie the Musical coming up. Uh, I think it's October 18th it starts, and then October 26th, Saturday, uh, Saturday October 26th, we're doing um, uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show at the Lynn Auditorium with a shadow cast. Just really appreciate everyone that's come out to support local theater in downtown Lynn. We are Lynn's only community theater and we do such a great job of bringing, you know, folks from all over the North Shore to downtown Lynn to experience live theater. Super proud of the youth theater initiative that we just put on this past July. Um, really amazing work that uh, Sam Gambaccini, our producing artistic director, is putting on and uh, really this event is just such a huge part of the success that um, we're able to bring to downtown Lynn and it really helps us to be able to put on these amazing really professional level productions. We do about five productions throughout the year. Um, and we also do a spelling bee usually as a fundraiser. We do a program for the kids to teach kids about acting and, and in the winter, theater. Yeah, and in the winter we do an event called the snowball. So this event tonight is called the meatball and then in the winter we have the snowball which is another fundraiser that we have. So there is a lot of really great um, theater outlets for kids in the North Shore, but nothing really in Lynn until uh, Arts After Hours start our youth theater initiative. There have been a few things um, over the past few years, but we're really hoping to make it a consistent uh, part of the downtown Lynn community. It's a great opportunity to bring people together to see great theater and to hear people with great talent and you know singing and um, great plays, great shows. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, people work hard, they're stressed, they need a, an outlet, they need a place to meet their neighbors and friends and to just enjoy a, a night out. So this is my third meatball um, as a part of the Arts After Hours board and year over year we continue to see it grow and we see some of the same familiar faces that have been around for all nine seasons of Arts After Hours, but then we continue to see new people that are coming into downtown Lynn and get to see the type of work that we're doing, and it really warms my heart to just see how local theater has impacted so many lives of folks and how we're able to bring everybody together at events like our meatball tonight and then our snowball in the winter. It's just a really fun time for us all to come together and raise money to put on these events incredible productions that bring people to downtown Lynn. The Massachusetts Young Republicans went to Lynn Woods for the first Young Republicans cleanup. The cleanup was a way for the Young Republicans to connect with their community. LCTV spoke with Joe Peru about the cleanup. The Massachusetts Young Republicans gathered at Lynn Woods for a park cleanup this past weekend. Today we are out here at Great Woods Road uh, to clean up the Wyoma Little League Park. Uh, we were inspired by some of the efforts down in Baltimore, Maryland, where some of our fellow Young Republicans uh, were cleaning up the city, some of the streets, the alleys, and so we just really wanted to give back to the community. The Young Republicans use the cleanup as a way to better their community as well as give children a safe and clean place to go out and play. Well, it's important because, you know, some people need a, uh, a place to escape uh, from their everyday lives, and one of those places is, is the park. And, uh, you know, people deserve a clean and safe environment, um, when, whether they come out to play basketball, baseball, whatever they may be doing in their, uh, their leisure time. Young Republicans hope the perceptions of Republicans are viewed differently after this cleanup. Yeah. Well, we're not we're not out here to seek credit, um, but what we do want to show is that uh, young Republicans and Republicans in general do care about the community. Uh, we get this bad uh, reputation in the media, um, not your media, of course, <laughs> um, and. Uh, 
just in public life that you know Republicans don't care about the community they don't care about people and that's just not true and we're here to show everyone that that is not true LCTV went down to Manning Field to speak with Lynn English football coach Chris Carroll about the upcoming season, football season. Now, you guys, back to back years, you guys made the playoffs. The year before, almost stayed in the championship game last year, you guys lost to Denver. It's a tough team in the conference. Mm -hmm. they, they had a good team, great team last, last season. So, you know, now you're looking forward. You know, it's always a turnover. So, how, what's, what's it going to be like conference play for some of these guys that, you know, that that were on the bench last year, but now they're going to get uh, their roles is going to be increased. Yeah, so there'll be, uh, there'll be some guys that have to step up. You know, that's just natural in high school football. Fortunately for us, we have a lot of guys who have a year or two experience because we didn't have a huge senior class last year, although players in that senior class were very good players. But the NEC is always tough. The conference has changed. The landscape's changed. Again, we're playing a lot of the same teams, a couple different ones. But, you know, every game's a battle. You know, right now we're trying to get better in camp every day. We're trying to get out of camp. And then when we get out of camp, you know, we got game one, and we know, and we know who we're playing game one so day by day you know and then just we'll take it like that to watch the full interview tune in to a brand new episode of after the whistle on wednesday september 4th on this week's community connector we highlight the 10th annual asian basketball tournament at breed courts hey. So we got this um, Asian tournament, um, basketball, um, outdoors, that been going on for over 10 years now. Um, we started at 09, and then it's been successful every, every year. Every year we get good competition out here. We do this for the community. You know, we get everyone together each year. Everyone look forward to it. You know, we have this going on for about, you know, um, over 10 years now, and everyone just look forward to it. You know, it's special. We first started playing in the tournament and then eventually um, just started running the tournaments ourselves because we wanted to keep this going uh, before it died out. So, you know, this is how, you know, we ran things and just wanted to keep it going. When we were younger, we played basketball our whole life and we went uh, we went to tournaments in Lowell, so um, I joined a, a, a Boston team called Massey, shout out to them. Um, so we travel and it's all like Asian tournaments out there, to New York, to Jersey, Virginia, Canada, um, Florida. So uh, we have a community of Asian basketball players here and I'm like, might as well do one here and test it out for the first year and we've been strong ever since. Oh, it feels great, man. Like, you know, it's the best feeling in the world when everybody's out here supporting you, um, knowing that I'm not really that famous or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, I just grew up here my whole life, so we got a lot of good ball players that just want to come out and just represent. Oh, it's really good. I mean, we got people coming all over the place, you know, from Providence, Lowell, you know, some we got people from New York, you got Lynn Cats, you got everybody. So it's um competition's really, really good. Once you reach the um the playoffs, it's basically one game elimination. Once you get knocked out, um that's it. The winning the winning team basically just moves on. I'm very happy, you know, each year it's been very successful, you know, each year we, we've, you know, we had the winning team and it's usually the team from Lowell that wins every year, um, but hopefully we could change that around this year. This is the last game right here, so it's about to be playoffs, um, it's going to be good comp, playoff is where it counts, if you lose you're out. To be honest, it's just like basically diversity, you know what I mean, like, you know, we just try to bring this back into the community and, and try to help everyone out and, you know, like I said, everyone look forward to this. Um, we do this once a year, so everyone's lo looking forward to come out and support us and, and you know, participate in everything else. So. Now for a weather update with meteorologist Justin Perry.
Labor Day weekend, everybody. This is meteorologist Justin Perry reporting for Lynn Community Television. It may be Labor Day weekend, but we have uh, quite a bit of work to do in the weather department as we now have a very strong hurricane potentially heading towards Florida uh, by the end of this weekend. You can see here, um, well east of Florida, Florida is here. Um, this is Dorian, now a category two hurricane which will be heading in the general direction of Florida over the next 72 hours. Um, we have a few model images here to show um, for the uh, storm system moving east. All right, and here is the pattern that exists right now as Dorian is heading towards Florida. We see a high pressure area which is located off of the east coast and the flow around this high is actually like this. So that is drawing Dorian towards Florida. However, the overall pattern is shifting from west to east across the United States. So what is happening is, is that there's actually a gap in between the two high pressure areas that's located over the Midwestern part of the United States and that gap is actually going to end up over the southeast states uh, within the next couple days. So what that does is that actually leaves um, Dorian with very little steering. Uh, as she gets towards Florida's coastline, she ends up in this gap, which will then be over this region, and she may just kind of sit there or stall or drift uh, anywhere just along the east coast of Florida. So that is kind of a uh, bad scenario that we're not looking forward to happening, but uh, right now a lot of our models are showing that possibility. Uh, speaking of the models, I have some uh, spaghetti charts to show you on the next map here. And first of all, ignore these. They're kind of experimental things that you know don't really matter too much to a meteorologist. This stuff is much more telling. So these are a combination of all of the models that we have access to. And what they do is they basically create a, a path of the storm as they, uh, as they run. So each model is depicted by one of these different colored lines that you see on the map. Unfortunately, as you notice, they all point towards one general location, Central Florida. So at this point, it's kind of in our best interest to say, well, all of the data that we have suggests that a Florida impact is very likely. The scary part, again, is that once she gets in this area here, very little movement is indicated by the models. So she's going to sit here, maybe drift into the Florida coast, maybe hang out just offshore, and then start to recurve north towards either the Outer Banks or maybe even offshore altogether. So. Yes, we have to prepare for a Florida impact, but there is some wiggle room still for the track along the east coast of Florida. These tracks can shift dramatically as we get new information from um, satellite images, uh, new soundings, weather balloon launches. There's uh, NOAA jets flying around doing sampling of, of the atmosphere around Dorian to get new data into the computer models to try to make as accurate as a forecast as possible um, so that we know who to evacuate and prepare for the impact. Um, on the next map, I can show you what, it, what to expect when a strong storm system like this does hit or make landfall. So Hurricane Dorian is expected to be a category three or four at landfall. So that's about as bad as it gets. Uh, Katrina was actually a category three when she hit New Orleans. So here is our projected path per the uh, National Hurricane Center. Um, they are expecting uh, Dorian to pass through the northern Bahamas and then into the central Florida coastline on the eastern side. Pretty much near, uh, I'd say that's like near Melbourne, Florida. So what we look for here is overall devastating damage. There's a high risk of injury or death if you're outside. Um, there's major damage to homes. Many trees, signs, and power poles will be downed. And there will be no water supply from part, potentially up to two to three weeks for the region as there's flooding, there's um, damage to all the infrastructure. So it's not, uh, drinking water will be hard to find and, and fresh 
water w could be contaminated if it's out um, on streets or um, sewage and things like that. So unfortunately, it's kind of a, a gross and damaging situation that happens when these things make landfall. So how does the pattern shape up and what does it look like for our region uh, while we watch this? Well, here's Dorian passing through the Bahamas and closing in on, on southern central Florida. Here's our high pressure system that is controlling the overall pattern with the anti-cyclonic flow, which is clockwise along the east coast. I've indicated to you a low pressure system over the Great, uh, Great Lakes or over the Ohio Valley that's going to move northeast through New York, um, and that's on Monday, so that's our rain chances for the week. Um, the high pressure is actually going to slingshot it up over uh, New England on Monday, so that will give us a chance for rain there. And then up over Minnesota, we have a low pressure system that's going to be tracking through uh, southern Canada and dragging a cold front with it. There's really not too much moisture with this by the time it gets over, over to New England, so I'm not expecting a major change, but on Wednesday, it might be pretty warm out ahead of that cold front. The cold front comes through, and on a Thursday, it's a nice fall or a late summer day. Uh, so I have a seven-day forecast for us uh, to show you. Um, today, Friday, we're looking at a, a temperature of about 84. Tomorrow, 78, so two beautiful back-to-back -back days. Unfortunately, as we get towards the holiday, we're looking at some rain um, starting maybe Sunday night and definitely on Monday. Uh, so not, the, not too nice of a temperature range there in the low 70s with rain. But then we recover on the back side of that. The high pressure is going to pump in some warmer air still, and that cold front in Canada will help. So Tuesday and Wednesday get temperatures up into the late 80s, and then Thursday temperatures uh, back down to closer to normal in the low 70s. I'm meteorologist Justin Perry for Lynn Community Television. Thank you for watching. Now time for some sports updates. The New England Patriots fell to the New York Giants 31-29 in their final preseason game last night. Jared Stidman, who played the entire game, went 18 for 28 for 225 yards with two touchdowns and one interception. Three Patriots receivers made their preseason debut last night. Julian Edelman, Demarius Thomas, and Josh Gordon all saw the field for the first time this preseason. This weekend, the Patriots finalized their 53-man roster and begin preparations for their season opener against the Pittsburgh Steelers on September 8th. Defending national champions Clemson Tigers routed Georgia Tech in their season opener last night. Starting quarterback Trevor Lawrence threw for, went 13 for 23 for 168 yards, throwing one touchdown and two interceptions. The Tigers got a big game from running back Travis Etienne, who carried the ball 12 times for 205 yards, which included a 90-yard touchdown run, the longest in Clemson history. Next for the Tigers is a matchup with Texas A&M. Xander Bogarts hit two homers as the Red Sox defeated the Colorado Rockies 7-4 last night. Raphael Devers also added a home run for the Red Sox, whose bats were connecting in this game. The Sox had 12 hits in this game. Eduardo Rodriguez got the win for the Sox. The Sox are in Los Angeles tonight to take on the Los Angeles Angels. First pitch is at 10.07 p.m. On the Lynn lineup, host David Riley Jr. spoke with Goldfish Pond Association about the 39th annual Goldfish Pond flea market. Here is this week's lineup. Welcome to the Lynn Lineup, a show highlighting upcoming events happening in the Lynn community. Today I'm joined by Kathy and Paul, and we're here today to talk about the 39th annual Goldfish Pond Fun and Flea Day happening Saturday, September 7th from 9 to 3, and the rain date is September 14th. Thanks for joining me today, guys. Thank you, We're Dave. happy to be here. So, the Goldfish Pond Association, it's been around for a little while, um, but some people may, may not know it exists outside of the, the Goldfish Pond area, and some people might not even know exactly what you guys do throughout the year. So, um, now is your time to shine. Let everybody in the community know what it is you guys do, uh, what other events you might have throughout the year, and... Um, Really, just like how long have you guys been around? 
Uh, next year will be our 40th year, uh, although we were really started in the early 1970s. Um, the organization didn't really take off, but our founder, Gerard Dewan, made another try in 1980, and uh, since then we've been very successful. Right, so so what, we, what we do, we actually started as a group that wanted to clean up the area and make it safe mm -hmm. and secure, but that eventually morphed into um, taking total charge of the maintenance of the park, and that morphed even further into planting all the beautiful gardens that we presently have. Um, taking care of the entire maintenance, mowing every single lawn, the island out in the center, raking and cleaning everything up in the fall, fixing park benches, uh, creating seasonal displays for everybody to enjoy. So picking up the trash, having the trash emptied weekly ourselves. So that's it. We've done everything and we raise money um, to be able to do all of that. And we've also worked with uh, city officials to secure grant money towards some of the larger projects. Uh, several years ago, we uh, repointed the wall because it was falling apart around the pond. And this fall, we expect to complete that project through the help of Darren Sear and the city council who secured us about $40,000 in block grant money to do that. So yeah, you guys get a lot of support from the city and from a lot of people within the community. Um, we couldn't and, do it without them, right, yeah. And the Fun and Flea Day is, we were talking before, your guys' biggest fundraiser of the year. Absolutely. And um, all the proceeds from this pretty much will go back to uh, helping uh, maintain the park like you guys do throughout right. the year. Right. So what, what, what sort of stuff does this go towards exactly? So it goes towards all of the lawn care maintenance The flowers, yep. Yeah, we probably, we plant about 2,000 flowers. So between the children's garden, the traffic islands, and the island itself. And that's done in um, like May or June, right? May. May is the um, big planting day. Um, Memorial Day weekend always. Mm -hmm. And then the children's uh, garden is planted two or three weeks following that. And the lawn mowers, the weed whackers, you know, all the kind of equipment a person needs to keep a nicely landscaped place up. And other things that come along, such as last year, we spent about $2,500 repairing the fountains that really make the oh, pond so attractive. Right. So. Yeah. So, the flea market itself is a pretty big event. <laughs> it, it's, yes. It fills up the whole park. Oh, yeah. Um, so who can get a table there, and what sort of stuff can you actually find at the flea market? Well, we say anybody with $35 can come <laughs> down and put a table up. We have lots of people, the neighbors that are there. We have people from the community in general, and we have people who come a distance. There's mm -hmm. one man that comes from Newton every year, so oh. we do have people who come from a wider range. Um, that's the kind of stuff you can find. Oh, almost anything you can think of that you'd see at any flea market or yard sale. Uh, people basically trying to clean out their garage. Uh, people with brand new uh, things. Uh, you can find shrink wrapped uh, games and puzzles sometimes. There's books, there's tools, there's hardware, there's clothing. Um, some original framed photography that mm -hmm. people have done. We have a woman coming down with jewelry that she makes this year, so all kinds of stuff like that. But the biggest, nicest thing about the Flea Day is we share Goldfish Pond with the yeah. rest of the community. It's a beautiful place to be. The day is a fun day. There are things for kids to do. There are things that uh, people who don't want to walk around can do, sit, have a cup of coffee, enjoy the beauty of the park. Um, kids can take boat rides, eat cotton candy, have their face painted, hop around the bouncy house, and of course anyone can look for a bargain and yep. find a treasure. So it's a, and food, we sell great food. Oh my God, they'd kill me if I didn't say that. Uh, old neighborhood sausages, meatball sandwiches, we get pizza from uh, Shoreline. Shoreline pizza, so you can have a nice lunch on the day. 
And we have a great raffle. Uh, $500 is the top prize, but we have many gift certificates as well. So um, as I've told people and I tell people over the PA system, if um, if you want to really win something, get a Goldfish Pond raffle ticket instead of a lottery ticket. And we also, in election year, have uh, often many of the candidates mm -hmm. come to visit and say hello, and that adds just a really great uh, dimension to the day. And we usually have about 45 vendors, and <laughs> typically we'll have at least 3,000 people pass through over the course of the day. So. Yeah, so it's not just a typical flea market, no. though. So you guys have a lot of stuff happening. <laughs> yes. It's very busy, yeah. It's hard oh. to spend less than an hour there. Yeah. And the bake table, a great bake table as well. People bake all week long. Mm. So we yep. have tons of brownies, cookies. We try to keep it so that there are things people can pick up, just a few things and, you know take them home and eat them there. So if people want a nice little snack or if they're yep. looking for like little knickknacks or anything like that, this would be a perfect event to perfect. go to. A perfect event. Uh, so we only got a couple of minutes left. Um, is there anything else you guys would like to add before we have to wrap it up? Uh, we just hope people can attend. Uh, come on down, even if you don't want to buy anything, you can browse, you can have something to eat. And it's also a community event. Um, some people only see each other on flea market day in the neighborhood. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. And the other thing uh, we want people to know, we've been doing this for 39 years. And mm -hmm. when we started the pond, the park, we're really a mess. And we just, if people come down and join us, they can see what can happen when the community gets together, works hard, and that, you know, we're people from all different parts of society, just a very diverse group. Age, anyway, mm -hmm. you can be diverse. Yep. We are diverse. Uh, and next year is our 40th anniversary, and we're really excited about being able to celebrate that together. And I'm sure we'll have you guys back in at some point. Oh, to talk absolutely. About the I'm hoping yeah. maybe four times at least. <laughs> Once for each big event. Yeah. So the big event that we're talking about this time, again, is the 39th annual Goldfish Pond Fun and Flea Day. That's happening Saturday, September 7th from 9 to 3, and rain date of September 14th. Thank you guys again for joining me today. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. And that's it for this edition of Lynn Lineup. Thanks for watching. Now time for some local events. Beginning today until Sunday, the annual Gresham Festival will be taking place at St. George Greek Orthodox Church. Greek cuisine, festival raffle, children's games will all be there as well as entertainment. The Back to School Bash will be taking place on Mount Vernon Street this Sunday from 2 p.m. until 7 p.m. Backpack giveaways, free haircuts, and much more will be available to those in attendance. On Thursday, September 5th, the 10th annual History and Hops will be happening at the Lynn Museum from 6.30 until 9.30 p.m. Breweries, music, 50-50 raffles, and surprises will be some of the highlights of the event. Entry is $25 for members and $30 for non-members. LCTV's next Paramount film series will take place on Monday, September 9th. The movie choice for September is Back to the Future. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. Movie begins at 7 p.m. Free popcorn and beverages will be available. Thank you for watching the LCTV News. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And visit us at lintv.org to watch any show, anytime on your computer, tablet, or phone. I'm Kyla Kabongo. Have a great day. Happy Labor Day.